I've taken some amazing astro photos this year and I wanted to share the equipment I used for those shots, my approach, and even some of the processing tips behind these images. After all, I know you're super pumped about the images I take, right? But the reality is if I can't provide you with useful information that you can apply yourself to take your own images, what's the point of watching? First up is the Seagull Nebula. This is an emission nebula that sits on the border of the constellations Monoceros and Canis Major. I was really blown away with this one. It was the first project I completed with the new ZWO ASI 2600mm Pro. Until this camera, I had never used a high resolution, large monochrome CMOS sensor before, and it was a real game changer. The signal that's collected, especially with a narrow band filter, is so strong and so pure. There is no comparison when you look at each color channel from a one-shot color camera and this one. This camera is still currently attached to the Skywatcher Esprit 100, the telescope used for this shot only now that system lives in the Black Dog Observatory. The filters that I use with this camera are Chroma 3 nanometer narrowband filters, and it's really a dream setup for me. When you have plenty of exposure time through each one of your narrowband filters, you have the advantage of being able to pull up those S2 and O3 signals to match the dominant H alpha. This is how you create stunning, well-balanced, in terms of color, Hubble palette images. Did I just give away the secret? For many deep sky objects, you'll need to double down on a particular wavelength, say O3, and this is where a quality filter and sensitive camera really prove their worth. I mean, when I look at this image, I see those brilliant golds and the deep blues, something that's really hard to achieve if you don't have enough signal in those S2 and O3 channels. And if you've ever tried to create that faux Hubble palette look using a one-shot color camera, that's the most difficult part to achieve this look. So if you really love these styles of images, go for a monochrome camera and narrowband filters and build the image that way. That's how you can really get this style of images. When, when I first saw this Seagull Nebula, I, was, I thought to myself, I finally did it. This is, this is how it's done. Next up we have the M106 Galaxy in the constellation Canes Venetici. And I'll say this right now, taking galaxy photos like this in my backyard is really challenging. The seeing sucks. I'm usually shooting through a thin layer of clouds or the moon is out. I guess what I'm trying to say is the guys downloading data from a remote setup in the desert will always crush my galaxy images. But I'm still super pumped about this image. To capture a small galaxy like this in detail has always been a dream of mine and it's a real thrill to see it come into fruition. When I think back to the smudges I used to capture with my DSLR and small refractor back in the day, this is really special. This one was captured using the big Celestron Edge HD11 SCT. And the reason I use that one, of course, is for that long focal length. The native focal length of that scope is 2800 millimeters. I used my full frame mirrorless camera, the Canon EOS RA, and I even used the reducer, the 0 0.7 times reducer, to bring the focal length back to 2,000 millimeters, but to bump up that light gathering ability just a little bit. The image scale is a bit off in this system, and you can probably tell when you look at the image. I am oversampled, which means that the stars and the details in the galaxy are a little soft. You can probably see that. Could I have achieved a better result using a shorter focal length refractor, something like the Esprit 150 at 1000 millimeters, and just crop the image into the galaxy? It's possible. Either way, the Edge HD11 is my long focal length scope that I use for anything small, really, and it's a huge thrill to pull in these small objects in for a closer look. Okay, next up is the Sunflower Galaxy. And again, I use the Celestron Edge HD 11, but this time I use the ASI 2600mm Pro dedicated astronomy camera in place of my mirrorless. Because this is a broadband subject, galaxies are, I used LRGB filters with this monochrome camera to create a full color image. I achieved a better result with this camera over my mirrorless camera, which shouldn't be so surprising. It actually has half of the exposure time of the M106 image, and I think there's a stronger signal overall. The moon was nearly full this night too, so not a bad result from the city under these conditions. Because I took these images bin one by one, 
The result is a little on the soft side, but I was able to sharpen it up quite a bit in post. The next time I shoot with this setup, I'll definitely bin two by two to sharpen things up a bit and improve the image scale. It'll be interesting to see if it makes a noticeable difference or not. I have a feeling it will. I find that image scale becomes a lot more important as you increase the focal length of your telescope. So if you're looking for a new scope, especially a longer reach one, Keep in mind the pixel size of the camera you're currently using. Okay, we've gone from super deep now to ultra wide. This is the Eagle Nebula and the surrounding emission nebulae in the constellation Serpens. This one was captured using my Radian 61 APO refractor at 275 millimeters in a full frame Canon EOS RA. A full frame sensor at 275 can pull in a lot of space at once. And for busy regions like this, it is so interesting and I I love it. The little Radian 61 was made for projects like this and from the moment it arrived I couldn't wait to point it towards the core of the Milky Way like this. To capture images like this from my backyard I really need some serious filters to cut through the light pollution of the light dome towards the center of the city. So for this one, I used the Radian Triad Ultra filter and it did a great job of separating the nebulous regions from a light polluted washed out sky. In my experience, I've found that the Canon EOS RA with a multi band pass narrow band filter is the sweet spot for this scope and the most practical way to use it. The Radian Triad Ultra and the Optolong L Extreme are the filters I reach for first when capturing emission nebulae and supernova remnants from my backyard here in the city. You get small stars, punchy dynamic highlights in the hydrogen regions, and that washed out sky is just gone. It's magic. Now this one really surprised me. This is the Pelican Nebula in Cygnus. And again, the ASI 2600 MM Pro monochrome dedicated astronomy camera was used and only narrowband filters in HA and O3 to be exact. So it's an HOO palette image and I just found the details to be extra sharp and beautiful in this region. The HOO palette is simply hydrogen mapped to red and then O3 map to the green and blue channels. It's a really nice look for a lot of objects, especially this Pelican Nebula. So this is what's possible using narrow band filters from the city. Just look at those crispy details in this object. Looking back, it's actually a little too sharp for my liking, and maybe you agree with that, but if you're tired of bloated stars and soft images, maybe this is exactly what you're looking for, this kind of look. It was also when I explored deconvolution in PixInsight for the first time, so maybe that had something to do with it. The telescope used for this shot was the Esprit 100, so focal length of 550 millimeters, which is perfect for these mid-range, mid-sized targets like the Pelican Nebula and nearby North American Nebula. If you're seeing a theme here, I use these 2600 and the Esprit 100 for a lot of projects this year, and I'm so happy with it. That's why that's the rig that went into the observatory, at least for now. Okay, time to go in a completely different direction. Planets. To be specific, the big boy, the gas giant known as Jupiter. Planetary astro or solar system photography is still largely unexplored for me simply because I didn't have a telescope with enough reach to pull them in for a closer look until recently. If you're currently a deep sky astrophotographer like me and you're thinking about tackling the world of planets, Wait, did I go backwards? Get ready for a whirlwind of new techniques and new software to learn. It's a completely different animal. Even though it's still tracking and cameras and telescopes, it's actually quite astonishing how different the overall experience is in planetary versus deep sky. All because instead of wide, long exposure images, it's ultra long, short video exposure files. My latest and best image of Jupiter was captured with a small planetary camera the ASI 462MC. It's a small, uncooled camera. It's essentially a like a guide camera with a tiny sensor on it. But this is the kind of camera you wanna use for planetary imaging. Photographing planets is essentially a game of recording video files of the planet under the best scene conditions with the best focus possible. Small sensors, high frame rates, and gigabytes of data bringing your PC to a crawl. Once you capture these videos, the stacking and registration process is pretty straightforward Forward and actually fun and fluid, you can really get up to speed quickly in this aspect. In my experience, the processing isn't nearly as intense as it is in Deep Sky, 
It's all a matter of making sure you captured that beautiful crisp video of the planet in as best seeing as possible. But as you can imagine, finding and tracking these planets at nearly 3000 millimeter focal length in my case is very demanding of the accuracy of your telescope mount. I use the Skywatcher EQ8 for my photo of Jupiter and this mount has been downright flawless since the day it arrived. And the impressive payload capacity allows me to mount large telescopes like this Edge HD 11. Lastly, we have my current favorite rig, the rig I reach for even if it's supposed to be clear for only an hour and a half. This photo of the Iris Nebula is somewhat of a bucket shot for me. I've always wanted to capture this reflection nebula under a truly dark sky and I finally did it. For deep images of dusty space like this, you can really create a dynamic scene by pulling up those faint areas of nebulosity and minimizing the, all the stars in the field. Tools like Starnet++ and the Enhanced DSO and Reduce Stars Action and the Astronomy Tools Action Set were made for processing photos like this. The telescope used for this shot is the new William Optics Red Cat 71, an ultra flat, well corrected imaging APO that was designed for wide field deep sky projects just like this. The camera used for this one was the ZWO ASI 2400MC Pro, so a color camera with a full frame sensor. This is essentially the cooled replacement for my mirrorless Canon EOS RA. A full frame allows me to utilize the native focal length of 350 millimeters on the Red Cat 71 and capture these large swaths of space in a single shot in full color. It's a beautiful thing. Remember, using a camera and telescope like this, this wide field, Gradients and light pollution can be a real pain if you don't deal with them correctly. Careful calibration frames, particularly your flat frames, are essential to really even out that field and to be able to create a healthy intermediate image for you to process further. I've been running this camera on the ASI Air Plus and I can officially say I'm back on the ASI Air train. It is just way too reliable and painless to ignore. My laptop is now reserved for imaging sessions that require more tools such as planetary imaging, or situations where I wanna use a non-ASI camera. I hope the descriptions of the gear I used for each shot and the reasons why have given you some useful insights that you can apply to your own progress in astrophotography. Having the opportunity to test a wide variety of gear, cameras and telescopes, gives me an extra appreciation towards the tools that allow me to move towards the image in my mind and not obsess over numbers on a screen. The clear winners in my mind this year were the ASI 2600mm Pro camera, which I should have mentioned did have the oil leak issue, but it was easy enough to clean and get back into action. It's just a shame that that's happened to so many people. The Celestron Edge HD 11 continues to deliver value to me in the form of my best images of planets and small galaxies to date. The Skywatcher EQ6 and EQ8 mounts have been so reliable that I just simply don't worry about things like tracking accuracy and guiding anymore. The only thing that sucks about these mounts is that they're impossible to find in stock these days. I wanted to thank all of you for watching my videos this year, whether you're new to the channel or a longtime subscriber. I'll end the video with a little best of 2021 montage, and I hope the images remind you of some of the stories and moments we shared together throughout the year. Until next time, clear skies.